Start recording, go. Hello and welcome to Office Hours with my very special co-presenter, my SQL Server advisor here, Beanie. Get back over here. Where do you think you're going, little man? Now you're camera shy. So yes, Beanie says, uh, welcome to Office Hours. Uh, we're in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, and I'm filming this one in Apple Spatial Video. So for those of you who have VR headsets, you can actually watch it in Spatial so you can see my sunburn, I suppose, in terrifying 3D. So let's go through your top voted questions. Uh, the number one question from DBA Mufasa asks, when we restore a database from a production source to a different server, do the index usage stats come along? No, they do not. Those are only kept in memory. So even worse, on the production server, whenever you restart that SQL server, uh, the index usage stats go away as well. That's one of the reasons why you probably want to log those index usage statistics with SP Blitz Index, our open source stored procedure from the first responder kit. Uh, you can actually log your index usage to tables so that you can check over time to see which indexes were used. I totally forgot to mention that I have my breakfast margarita here, and technically any margarita can be a breakfast margarita. Woohoo! We'll see if my answers get more emotional or less coherent as the session goes on. Uh, next up, we have Trushit who asks, uh, let me click, I missed it on the screen there. Trushit asks, I have a stored procedure that uses XML path to create an XML tree. I want to store this in a variable. However, the stored proc returns a column with a link to the XML tree. When I click on the link, the full tree is visible. How do I access the entire tree? Trushit, it sounds like what you're doing is you're using SQL Server Management Studio to consume the results. You don't want to do that. You want to use an application. If you're bringing back the XML to do some kind of juggling in the application, go test it with your application so that you can see the results that it's bringing back. Because in SSMS, they just don't render the full tree by default, but the full tree is there. It's not like a hyperlink to, link to something. It's just opening in a new window to make it easier to see the results. Next up, my T got cold says, I like your arguments for always setting fill factor to 100. Do those same arguments mean that I should default to using data compression equals page on my row store indexes? The gotcha with uh, recommending that across the board is that there's extra CPU consumed in order to read and to write those data pages. So I, I don't like that across the board as a universal recommendation because some SQL servers are CPU limited, not all of them, but some of them. The worst case scenario would be when you're repeatedly reading the same values from a page over and over again. Since that page is stored compressed in memory, you're going to burn CPU overhead every time you read the contents of the page. So depending on your workload, that can make your CPU go up by a lot. Now, of course, it's easy for Mr. Consultant Man to say that you should be caching that data in the application instead of reading it every time you need it. But now at least you start to understand why that's not a universal recommendation. Rose Noble says, you mentioned your aversion to linked server queries. Are linked server sprocks acceptable? To me, no. Go connect to the SQL server that has the data that you need. You don't want your SQL server constantly calling other SQL servers because those results aren't cached. I don't want that overhead of going across the network from one SQL server to another, grabbing data every time, especially if there may be things like transactions involved. Stop doing that. I don't understand why people want to do that. Next up, Genuinely Curious says, we're using standard edition at the moment. When should I start thinking about enterprise edition? 
Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, for me, the, the number one uh, or the, the first early on reasons are you need multiple availability group replicas, you need more than 24 CPU cores, or you need more than 128 gigs of RAM to cache data. Those would be the places that I would start. Vishnu asked a question. We've actually covered that before. I'll skip that one. Uh, Yord says, what are the top issues that you see for read, rolling out read-only availability group replicas? First is the complexity, that they're much more complex than just putting in something like log shipping. Um, the SQL servers have to be able to communicate directly to each other, and that will often fail, especially uh, across networks. The next uh, issue that I see all the time is that when replication breaks, people don't know. They're querying the readable replicas thinking that their data is up to date when it's not. There's nothing built into SQL Server that will warn you, hey, you're querying out of date data. It's up to you to roll some kind of check into your application to see whether or not the data is up to date or not. And that is way beyond the complexity of what most people think about when they're putting out read-only replicas. Pink Pony asks, what's your opinion on setting the auto update stats asynchronously method? Should we set that to true? Pink Pony, there's a question that you'll hear me ask all the time. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? I heard it makes some things go faster. Maybe I should push that button. Sure. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Instead of randomly looking around for different buttons to push, look at what your SQL Server's top bottleneck is. I have never in my entire storied career working with SQL Server ever seen a SQL Server where the number one complaint from users was, it's taken forever to run my queries because statistics have to be updated. I have never ever seen that. You might be the exception, but if you're asking the question, my guess is you're not. Focus on your top bottleneck. Next up, oh, this is related. Miles asks, uh, when I'm, uh, often when I'm tuning resource-intensive queries, I don't know what to sort by. Should I sort by the most CPU-intensive queries, the most storage-intensive queries? Hey, get down from there. Beanie's trying, come on, get back down from there. Beanie's making a noise, like, making it look like he's going to go jump off. The no, 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 you don't need to be near the hot tub. Come here. Yeah, no, 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 no. Let's get you back over here. Um, when I'm sorting resource-intensive queries, which way should I sort on? It all comes down to what your SQL Server's top bottleneck is. Is your top bottleneck CPU? Is it locking? Is it resource semaphore? Is it page I.O. latch? Is it write log? And I teach you how to measure those using SP Blitz first in my Mastering Server Tuning class. So that's the place where you can go start if you're just getting started. Next up, Genuinely Curious asks, if Azure SQL DB managed instances are as good as SQL Server and they require less maintenance, why would people keep using SQL Server? Oh, that's actually a good question. When managed instances came out, I thought that they would be the future of SQL Server. They uh, have a lot of compelling uh, things about them that make management way easier. For example, you'll often hear me say, Availability groups are kind of complex to set up and kind of complex to troubleshoot and make sure they're still working. Well, with managed instances, you don't have to do that. Microsoft is basically your database administrator, which is kind of awesome. So there are two reasons that people might not adopt managed instances. One is cost. It's more expensive to use that as opposed to SQL Server if you're only looking at the price tag of managed instances versus the licensing costs of SQL Server. But what folks are missing there when they do that comparison is that they're not also noticing the costs of their database administrator. People like me 
ain't cheap. And so managed instances is cheaper than I am in some cases. So that's one cost or one, one reason when they're comparing costs. Uh, the other reason is that not everybody wants to go to Azure. I, as a matter of fact, the vast majority of my clients uh, who are in the cloud are actually in Amazon. They're in Amazon EC2, Amazon RDS. I, I don't think that that means that Amazon is bigger. I'm, I'm kind of more well known in the Amazon space than I am in the Azure space. There may be a ton of people using Azure managed instances uh, that I just never get the chance to work with. So that could be. Uh, next up, TJ asks, I've got a redo thread, speaking of availability groups, a redo thread on my secondary replica tends to get bit blocked by select queries, which then block other queries. We have to kill the selects to resolve blocking. Is this the correct way to handle this situation? My guess is that you're probably dealing with an older version of SQL Server that only has single threaded redo. Newer versions of SQL Server, uh, 2019 and 2022, I believe, have multi-threaded redo. Now, I'm shorthanding a lot here. I'm like summarizing a lot because there are a whole bunch of gotchas with this. Not all of your databases get multi-threaded redo. It depends on whether you're using uh, uh, like large numbers of databases or small numbers of databases. But that would be the first place that I would go look. Are you on a 2019 or 2022 version of SQL Server? The other thing that I would look at is are those databases actually getting multi-threaded redo? Because that's not the case uh, for, I'm going to say, if you have more than 10 databases, it's time to start investigating whether you're getting multi-threaded redo. And then the last thing that I would look at is you may need index tuning to satisfy the workloads on the secondaries. If blocking is that important to you on the secondaries, you may need to look at index tuning for your selects there as well. Next up, SQL Stormlight says, my friend needs to design a disaster recovery solution across data centers for over 2,000 databases. It seems like the best option is a failover clustered uh, instance, but how do they deal with the shared storage? So, what you're really asking is, I'm trying to design a complex, out of the ordinary solution for high availability and disaster recovery. What should I do? And I know I do consulting for a living, so this is going to sound a little bit like a sales pitch, but you are not going to find short, Googleable answers when you're dealing with thousands of databases on one SQL server you're way outside of the norm in terms of what most people do, and you're really gonna wanna talk to someone who's done this before to get one-on-one -on -one advice based on your own situation. You're gonna wanna consult them. I don't care whether it's me or someone else, but who does this for a living, who has a set of questions they can use to say, all right, what's your goals for this? What's your future for this? What's your licensing cost absorption for this? Uh, they can go through this question list and help you find a solution that's right for you. Uh, your future cloud goals, what brand of SAN you're using, uh, how you intend to do failovers, whether you do any cross database transactions. There are a huge list of questions that consultants like me will ask for stuff like this. And if you just go for like a Reddit answer or a Stack Exchange answer, you're gonna get bad answers that miss obvious problems uh, inside your own art infrastructure. So be careful with that. All right. You know, it's funny. Um, when I do these office hours, I, I try to help folks for as much as I can for free. You'll notice that as you go through these kinds of answers, um, that the vast majority of them either give you the answer directly or tell you exactly where in a blog post or a training class that you need to go to get those answers. And I don't charge for that. I'll never do um, like YouTube subscriptions or anything. I do all of that for free. Because my philosophy is always that 
If I can get you the answer in a matter of seconds for free, then I need to do that, because if I won't, then someone else will. And probably one out of 10 or one out of five of the answers are, you should pay me for that. You know, you should pay me for consulting for that. You should uh, pay me for performance tuning for that, for whatever. Um, but I really too try, do try to get you all the free stuff as much as I possibly can. Um, just be aware that every now and then you're going to hit edge case scenarios, especially as you deal with complex things as your career starts to mature, where you do have to bring in a paid professional or you do have to pay to attend a, a paid training class. And that's always going to be true uh, no matter what database you use, no matter what programming language you use you're gonna hit walls at certain points where you just have to pay for somebody for advice. Now, I always try to set an example with the open source scripts, with the blog, giving everything away for free. Um, but sooner or later, you're gonna have to pay people like me to take vacations in Cabo uh, when we're not answering your questions. <laughs> Delicious breakfast margarita. All right, well, that's about the end of this office hours. Uh, today we're flying back home to Las Vegas, where it's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than here, ironically. It's actually really nice here. It's in the 70s uh, this morning. I'm going back to uh, Las Vegas, and I'm going to be in Las Vegas for most of the rest of the summer. I'm at home for like two months straight, and then uh, going to uh, Alaska for a cruise at near the end of August. Um, used to, well, a long time ago, started a thing called SQL Cruise with a few friends of mine where we taught SQL Server training classes aboard cruise ships. Um, I miss that a lot. I miss getting together with friends and talking about databases aboard cruise ships. I don't know that that market will ever come back, you know, post-pandemic, um, but I have thought about getting together with a bunch of friends in different tourist destinations, you know, perhaps in Iceland next year, uh, and doing uh, like a one-week sabbatical where people can go learn about whether it's consulting or blogging or presenting or something like that. We'll see what happens in the future. So thanks for hanging out with me, and I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.